Allison Lack with ECTV. Today we watch Nayeli C. Garcia interview Dr. Jose Alamillo, who is a professor and the chair of the Department of Chicana and Chicano Studies at California State University, Channel Islands. Enjoy the show. Hi, my name is Nayeli C. Garcia with ECTV, and today we are talking with Dr. Jose Alamillo, who is a professor and the chair of the Department of Chicana and Chicano Studies at California State University, Channel Islands. Thank you for being here with us today. You're welcome. Now, my first question is, I wanted to start by asking you, where did you grow up and how did you become a professor? Um, so I was born in Mexico, in Zacatecas, the state of Zacatecas, and then at seven years old I came here um, and joined my family who was already here in Ventura, in the city of Ventura. Um, I grew up here in, in the city since the age of seven, went through all the public schools, and uh, in high school I remember, I think entering ninth grade at Buena High School, that I was invited to be part of a summer academic enrichment program and it was part of a you know ELP uh, outreach program mm -hmm. that they had and I believe that um, they sent only several students from the school for the summer program so that first year of my freshman in at high school I was invited to go to the UCSB campus and it was like a like a four-week program and I just remember having a great time <laughs> being on a college campus. I didn't know what a college yeah. was. And uh, they did a lot of fun things like go to the beach, go camping. And it, it didn't feel like, like you were doing really like work, right? It just felt like you were in like summer camp in a way. And I think that's where I got the idea of going to college. And so I was my first, the first of my family to go to college um, straight from high school. Um, and in college is where I got the idea of becoming a professor. But it came really in my fourth year, I believe, in college. So it was a kind of, a, you know, one of those things where, you know, it took a long time to, for me to figure out what I wanted to do for like a, for a career. And in my fourth year, I started to ask my professors like, hey, you know, what should I do with this major? <laughs> you know, that's always a question, right, that students have. Well, I'm majoring in this field, but I don't know what I'm going to do with this, you know? And so for me, it was just a matter of asking questions and exploring different um, careers. And um, I just remember one of the professors started asking me, so what do you like to do? And, you know, and I said, well, I'd love to be involved in like different campus activities, university activities. I was involved in a lot of different clubs and different um, groups and just really I just loved university life, and you know, I think at that point, and I, was, I didn't want to leave it. And so, like, well, if you don't want to leave university life, then you should consider being a professor because then you can work here all the time. Like, really? <laughs> I didn't know you could do that. <laughs> so, that's where the idea of being a professor came. Is is my my faculty mentor, in you know, literally suggested that I go to graduate school and get my degree to become a professor. What classes do you teach at CSUCI? Um, I teach a range of courses. I, since I'm the chair, I teach probably less courses than other faculty, but I usually teach like the introduction course to the major. Um, um, and since I have background mostly in history, I tend to do the course on Chicano and Chicano history. And then I also teach um, well, we have a, a kind of like a capstone course that we do community-based research in the community. So I teach that class and then like a theory course as well. So I usually, you know, teach one of those or two of those depending on the needs of the department. Hmm. As a professor, how would you define Chicana and Chicano studies? So for me, um, Chicano and Chicano studies is about learning the history of Mexican Americans and Latinos and Latinas in the United States. But more than just learning about the history, I think it's also learning their contributions, um, their challenges, um, and also how they use that, that history for empowerment of their communities. So it goes beyond just a study of a particular subject, 
but also taking it to the next level of like, now that you know this history, now that you know this mm -hmm. knowledge, how are you going to use it? And so we teach students how to become change makers in their community. And that's really where the social justice a component of the field comes in. And I really love doing that. I love how students become empowered to go back with that knowledge into the community and change, change their community, become involved in their community, uh, make important change they need to, that needs to be made, right? So that's really the, the crux of like what Chicano Chicano Studies is. I really love how you involve other students uh, with it too. But how would you think about the significance of Chicana and Chicano studies at CSUCI for Ventura County? Well, uh, f for the significance to Ventura County, I always remember, you know, growing up in the county and always wanted to leave the county. And for a lot of us who are growing up in the county, I always feel that, like, you know, I wanted to come back to the county and give back by being a professor here where I grew up because I wanted it to show students that there's something rich and beautiful about being in Ventura County and growing up here. There's So I wanted to kind of counter that notion that to be part of this county is to be a negative, right? To be a deficit. I want them to see and learn that there's a community wealth in Ventura County, that they could come back to, you know, even if they leave, and contribute to the richness of Ventura County. So I feel like Chicano and Chicano Studies is about that. It's about teaching students to learn w what the community wealth is from their neighborhoods and where they grew up, and also to learn that like they could be, you know, one of those persons that can really make that change and make it better, right, so that you could raise a family here if you want to. You could make a career out of it. So I always feel like, you know, Ventura County is such an important, special place that no one should want to leave, that they should want to stay, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's really how it's, how Chicano Studies really contributes to the county. And I also wanted to just congratulate you for the 15th anniversary quinceanera of Chicano and Chicano Studies Department at CSUCI. Could you tell us about the origin and how it's developed over the 15 years? Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, we've been around for 15 years. And it's, it's remarkable to look back and think about when I first arrived in 2008 to help build the, this department and, um, you know, when I arrived, the groundwork had already been laid for, for it. And it took really the community to build it and to push for it. Um, you, you had faculty in, in the university, but also outside, many alumni from Cal State Chano Islands, but also Cal State Northridge, some from UCSB, who would return to their community and really were putting the principles of, you know, coming back into practice. They were learning about how, how can we establish Chicano Chicano Studies in the county? And so they advocated for the department. They spoke to the president and they really pushed hard and made the president realize it like, you know, we need, we need this department here, you know, because look who we are, you know, we're almost 50% Latinx population in the county. So there's really no reason why not having a Chicano Studies department. Um, and I think that that's what it took. It's a lot of community um, advocacy, a lot of alumni from other universities uh, who understood the value of Chicano Studies because they were former you know, graduates of that field. And so they knew that like, we needed it for the youth who are, are here and who can't leave the county, or maybe don't want to leave, but they want to be exposed to this discipline. What are the goals for the future for this department? So we're, you know, 15 years, but we want to grow. We want to hire more faculty, <laughs> certainly. Um, we want to also help grow eth other ethnic studies departments. Um, since we're the only one for almost 15 years, so now black studies is getting off the ground. Um, and so we're going to be introducing now Native American studies um, and Asian American studies as well. Uh, I think those are important as well. And so we also want to have the opportunity for those that graduate to come back and maybe earn maybe a master's degree in the department or we were thinking of maybe offering a certificate 
for you know those professionals who live here who may want to you know earn a certificate maybe they want to use it in their job as a social worker or as a teacher you know a lot of teachers want to teach ethnic studies now in high schools so we want to offer that opportunity for them to take you know courses so they can earn a certificate so those are a couple ideas that we have those are great ideas i'm excited i for think that. so um, I wanted to back up a little bit and sure. ask you about how your growing up experiences led to led you to your first book, um, Making Lemon Le- Making Lemonade Out of Lemons. Yeah, so I did mention that you know growing up here, my family worked in the lemon industry. Um, my dad picked lemons for Limonera Company. My mom packed lemons and oranges for Limonera Company. Um, but for other, you know, packing houses in the area. So growing up, we lived in a, in a small lemon ranch community. And so people may not know that Limonero del Mar is this tiny neighborhood, you know, located on Telegraph Road between Victoria and Kimball. And you would miss it if you, you know, if you look and you see it, but there's little houses that we lived in. There were company houses that, you know, were owned by the company, but um, it is, at least it offered my family to you know, have a job, right? But also for us to stay year round and grow to school year round. So I think to me, the lemon industry gave my family a job, but it also gave the children an opportunity to study year round and go to school. So to me, I was fascinated by that because I would read about like farm workers, right? They would go from crop to crop. And I was like, but that's not the case with this lemon industry. So that gave me the idea of like, hmm, I wanna maybe research more about it. And that's what I did. I went about and started interviewing families like mine, but also finding out that like, wow, the, you know, we weren't the only ones in a very similar situations. There were so many of them and they all had very different kinds of experience. So I expanded the, that interest to really, you know, look at how, you know, the industry of the lemon industry is really a Southern California phenomenon. It's not just in Ventura County, but it's also like in the, you know, Inland Empire, Riverside, it's in also in the Orange County and, and many of the Claremont area. So it, it really opened my eyes to the fact that like citrus industry was an important economic engine for the founding of Southern California. Um, and so the fact that we, you know, take it, you know, we see the landscape of lemon orchards even to this day in the area where you don't see that in any other county, I think says something about like its importance and its economic importance, right, to the county. So I think that's really what got me interested in, in that first book that I wrote. Can you tell me a little bit about other experiences too that inspired you um, for Deportes? Yes, Deportes is my second book. Um, so one of the things that you know I did growing up is we, we would get together every weekend at Arroyo Verde <laughs> and we would play sports. And baseball was of course the biggest and most popular sport. So. I grew up playing sports every weekend with my cousins, and and um, that was also very interesting to me. That sports was for me a community bonding experience uh, for the family, but also for my with my friends and neighborhood. And so I was fascinated by the fact that it was it was sports, but it was more than sports. And so I I use sports as a lens to examine um, not just baseball, but other sports that brought communities together. And I was also very fascinated by how the fact that like when you form community around sports, you do it more than just forming community. You're actually uh, building something new. And so for for me, I found out that like sports didn't just bring people together, but it actually empowered them. It gave them confidence to then go out and do bigger and better things. And so it became a confidence booster. And so you you see that a lot of athletes become important leaders in their community. Why? Because through sports, they learn how to become a leader. They learn how to organize. They learn how to work with others. And so I became fascinated by that. And in particularly fascinated with that in the Mexican community. And because when we think about sports, we don't really think about Mexican athletes. We think maybe Latino athletes, maybe, you know, some well-known athletes, but very, very few people knew that we also had a lot of important Mexican-American champions in history, you know? And when I asked my students, well, name one. <laughs> they can really, they can't really name one, maybe. Maybe they'll name Fernando Venezuela, right? 
that's the one person that comes to mind. But when I ask, well, what about in the sport of tennis? Who is that one Mexican American that won back to back US Opens? They're like, really? Back to back? Yeah, 48 and 49. Pancho Gonzalez, Mexican Americans who grew up in LA. They don't know who he is. So I realized we need a book about this subject, you know, and that's why I wrote Deportes. Wow, that's very inspiring. Um, could you tell me a little bit about the Mexican-American baseball in Ventura County? Yeah, th that project started with what you just said earlier, that mm -hmm. I involved students in my research. Um, I involved some students doing that research, looking at locally what was happening around sports. And that's during the time I was writing that book, um, Deportes. I wanted to know what was going on locally, and so I got students to go in their communities and literally knock door to door <laughs> and ask the question, do you have any athletes in the family that I should know about? <laughs> and literally they did that. They actually went and started talking to their neighbors. And guess what? They found all this information. And I'm like, what are we gonna do with this? So let's put an exhibit together. So we collaborated with the Museum of Ventura County to put together an exhibit on Mexican Americans in baseball in Ventura County. And let me tell you, it was amazing to see the outpouring of the community that came to the exhibit and just telling their stories. And the community was like, wow, we never felt recognized like we are now in this exhibit. Thank you for doing this. And so to me, it was like, oh my God, like we did, we did all this work for the community to finally be recognized for all their efforts. And so I think students, when they saw that, I was like, wow, I did not know that this was gonna have that kind of impact. And it did. And so then we decided at that point, well, we need to put it together into a book. Because, you know, an exhibit ends. <laughs> and, and, no, and everybody gets about it. But with a book, it lives on. So students help put together that book. Um, and, and I think that that's really how it got started. And I think students really were the main driving force uh, with, that, with that book. Uh, I think... That is absolutely amazing. Your process on making these books, it's going to inspire so many generations to come. So thank you for that. I wanted to ask a little bit. I was looking in the Mexican-American baseball in Ventura County, and I wanted you to explain to me a little bit about the Bracero program part in that. Yeah. So one of the chapters in that book focuses on the Bracero program and you probably ask well why would a book about sports and baseball include the Bracero program well we discovered in our research that a lot of the athletes that we found were also braceros so braceros is just a term we use to refer to mexican contract workers who came from mexico to work in the u.s legally for a contract about 12 to 18 months. And after that contract was over, they would have to return. Well, many of them came to Ventura County to work many, many different times, many multiple times, right? So they got a lot of different contracts in multiple years. So ultimately, many of these braceros made a home in Ventura County because they loved it so much. They, they loved the, the, you know, to be in the county where they felt at home, right? They also probably met a lot of friends and family, you know, encouraged them to come back. So we started, <coughs> sorry, <coughs> we started interviewing these Bracetos and um, they were just sharing their story about playing baseball, you know, and that's the one thing is like, no, you know, we also wanted to know about, about their work life, but they're like, no, that's too boring. I want to talk about all the home runs I, I, I had, <laughs> all the championships we won. So it became a love, a passion for them. So we wanted to make sure that we included that in the book, you know, because mm -hmm. we, we wanted, again, to recognize their contributions, right? Not just as workers, but it's like also, you know, people who, you know, lived outside of work and had a life. And of course, playing baseball was their favorite sport and favorite pastime. So we're like, well, we're gonna include that, you know, because they're also contributing to the, to the community, right? Through sports, so we did that. Yeah, recognition is 
extremely important. And I also want to thank you for including a picture of my abuelo. He was a racero, mm -hmm. and he loved to play baseball. So that's also cool. Um, I wanted to ask, what other projects are you working on right now? So I have two projects. Um, one is um, called Dark Waters Floods, Mexicans and the Politics of Disaster Relief in uh, the U.S.-Mexico border lands. It's a term we use to kind of speak about how in multiple communities we see floods that happen and how many of these floods um, impact different communities differently and in particularly affecting poor working class Mexican communities m worse because for many of those communities they're located in low-lying areas and so disasters ultimately have huge consequences for them for life and property loss. So I, was, I became interested in that story through uh, looking at the St. Francis Dam disaster of 1928. When that happened here in Ventura County, um, I became interested in learning about how it impacted that community in Santa Paula and uh, looking at the, the disaster relief and asking the question, well, why it, why after that disaster did they have separate relief camps? One for whites and one for Mexicans. And so I discovered that in, even in disaster relief, there was segregation. And I was like really shocked by that. Maybe I shouldn't have been, but I was. And so I'm like, wait, was this happening across other communities? So that's one project. The other project is called Untold Legacies, uh, Ventura's, Ventura County Ethnic Studies Reader. And so there I'm putting together an edited volume of chapters, essays, poetry, creative expressions on, on different ethnic groups, especially you know Asian Americans, Latino groups, Afri African Americans, and Native American indigenous groups to really highlight their contributions to the county. And I want this to be a kind of book where we could teach in a course, like in community college or high school, um, about the contributions of these groups, right? They haven't really been um, recognized for their contributions to Ventura County history. You know, most Ventura County history is very romanticized uh, to talk about the Spanish mission, Ventura, you know, and, and the Rancho days, and it's like, okay, really? <laughs> Come on, there's more to that. Uh, you know, so I think I'm trying to, uh, you know, bring that, 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 that ethnic studies lens to local history. So that's my hope is to kind of get that volume, that book, textbook out and, and really being used in, in courses, especially like in the high schools. Uh, how are you going to be, if you are using students to help you on this research, yeah. how are you going to do that? I integrate students in all my classes in research, right? So, um, for example, just um, over summer, um, I have students work with me on this research. Um, we have a program called the Summer Undergraduate Research Fellowship Program, SURF. And so, so I tell students, so for summer, what are you going to do? Are you going to go surfing? It's like, yeah, no, no. Are you going to go and work with me in the surf program? I'm like, oh, yeah, that surf. <laughs> so we use that term to like refer to not just, you know, surfing waves, but surfing in research, right? So I teach students how to do research over the summer. And so they work, they're going to work on with me on that project. Um, and I also integrate them in like courses during the semesters. I teach, I told you, the community-based research course. And so in there, I have students work on projects, local projects, and so I have a whole list of them they could choose from, and yeah, and that's kind of how it's done. I, you know, try to integrate it little by little in courses um, as assignments, and then also as undergraduate research over the summer. I really like how you're working with students. I think that just stories also not from maybe big names, it just helps the students feel acknowledged. I think that's really important. Uh, I was going to ask, do you, how can other people uh, find out about your work? Like, do you have a website at all? I do. Um, they could just type my name, just Google my name, and they'll find the website. 
Um, they could also find me on social media. I'm on every platform, I think. <laughs> maybe not TikTok yet. <laughs> or maybe I am. I don't know. I think I am on TikTok. Okay. So, yeah, social media uh, website um, on campus. You could just go on the website on the university campus website and type my name, and there's a directory that will lead you to my website. Um, that Yeah, you could, you could find me pretty much anywhere on, online. Um, but I'm also available on campus, so if you ever come to campus, just ask. If where you they can find me and everybody knows me on campus, so they'll find me. They'll direct you to my office. All right. Well, thank you so much for spending some time with us today and for your work uh, for telling our important community histories. Que viva Chicana y Chicano studies. Que viva. Thank, thank you. Thank you for so me. much for watching. I'm Nayeli C. Garcia, and this is ZCTV. Thank you, Nayeli C. Garcia, and thank you to Dr. Jose Alamillo for your significant work. This has been ECTV. Thanks for watching. <laughs>